And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Nancy Rines, artist, author, and inspirational speaker who had two near-death experiences, and we're going to learn about them today. Nancy, thank you for being my guest, and welcome. Thank you so much for having me on your show today. I'm really looking forward to it. All right, Nancy, my audience loves to hear about NDEs. So if you don't mind, let's just start with your first one. All right. I'm going to dive in actually a little bit before the NDE because it gives a little context to to why this was so impactful for me. So most of my adult life, um, I was a scientist. I actually got my degree in geology and I have a minor in archaeology, so really steeped into the physical sciences. And during that time, um, I really developed into, I kind of went back and forth really between an atheist and an agnostic. I really didn't believe in a whole lot of spiritual stuff. I kind of wanted to, but I didn't see any evidence for it. And as a scientist, I was really all evidence-based. You know, I needed to see concrete proof. So I, I didn't really dive into any of that stuff, although I was kind of interested in what people were experiencing. So I, but I spent most of my adult life from the time I was in university up until the time I was in my mid forties when this happened, it really is as an agnostic atheist, kind of going back and forth. You know, I sometimes was open to believing in stuff. Sometimes I wasn't, but I really wasn't, you know, into any of what we're talking about today. So that was where I was in, you know, late 2013. I was still, you know, as an atheist, agnostic, and was starting to get a little bit dissatisfied with my life. Um, Not in a huge way, but I was feeling I I was a bit unhappy with the way things were headed in my life at that time. But I really didn't have any clue as to what I wanted to do to change it. And, and that was, I would say, like October, November of, of 2013. So I just rolled with that and, and didn't really do anything. I was going to, I was going to think about actually looking for a new job, you know, in, in, in the early new year. So I just didn't do much over the holidays, but I started having, you know, in December of 2013, I started having some really odd dreams, which for me, at that time were very unusual, like dreams of thousands of butterflies around me. And I didn't, it they were, it was so real, but I didn't know what it meant. And I wasn't huge into dream interpretation at that point. So I didn't pay a lot of attention to it. Um, but I did mention it to one of my sisters who is quite spiritual and she was a little freaked because to her, you know, that, that symbolism of, of the butterflies meant, you know, soul leaving the body kind of thing. She, she saw it as a premonition of, of death. And I was like, I don't think so. This is, you know, it's just butterflies. Um, but she was, she was a little bit freaked out by that, but I just tried to ignore it. Um, and a few weeks after that first dream, I was actually bicycling in my home at that time I was living in the Boulder Colorado area and went out on a bike ride near my home one morning and if this was January 3rd of 2014 I had taken some time off work um, and the the weather happened to be really really great that day it was like going to be 65 70 degrees and it was dry so I thought I'm going to go out for a bike ride and just run some errands around town so I went off on my bike ride and not even a half a mile from my house, there was a brand new traffic circle, a roundabout. Um, and, and those at that time were fairly new in our little community. Like I think that one had been put in just a few months before. So people really didn't know, you know, how to navigate it, how to, you know, come into it and stop. Um, and, and there has there was a bike lane on the road that I was on, which is where I was cycling, that continued on the other side, but they had forgotten to put room for a bike in the traffic circle. Like it was so narrow. 
that when I came into the traffic circle, I had to take the whole lane. There was nowhere else for me to go. And um, there was a guy in a, in a, I think it was a Subaru that was behind me. And as I was in the circle, I could, there was uh, another road coming in to the circle from my right hand side. And there were two vehicles on that. One was a, a big SUV sport utility vehicle. And then the second one was like a Toyota, small Toyota truck. Um, and that first one, at first I thought that she was slowing down um, because that's what you're supposed to do, slow down and come to a stop for any traffic, you know, in the circle. But when, when I got up to where her, her road, you know, where the road came in, I saw that she was actually speeding up instead of slowing down. It was almost like she was trying to beat me, you know, and, and get around the circle. But, but when I got up to her now, I couldn't, I couldn't maneuver very well because I had a guy right behind me. So I was trying to slow down and, and navigate my way through this situation. And I got to the point where there was nowhere to go and I couldn't get out of the way. The, the traffic circle was so narrow that I couldn't get out of the way. And um, the woman that was coming in from my right hand side, from this side, just hit me. She didn't even see me. Um, she hit me broadside on my right hand side and somehow I ended up, I don't really, I don't know how this happened, but I ended up flipping in the air and landed on the hood of her vehicle, which was a, like a big Chevy Tahoe type of thing. And I'm, I'm literally looking in the windshield at through, you know, through the windshield at this woman who was, she looked like she was in her late twenties. And the reason she didn't see me is she was texting. She had her phone balanced up on the steering wheel as she was trying to drive. And I guess she had been texting for a while because she was really, you know, intent on this thing. So she didn't see me looking in the windshield at her. So she just kept driving right around the traffic circle like nothing had happened. No big deal. And and here, you know, I'm kind of trying to pound on the on the hood of her vehicle, trying to get her attention. Didn't work. And I couldn't hang on it. There was really not much I could hang on to as she's driving. And I kind of lost my grip on on the vehicle. And so I started slipping down the hood, fell off the front of her truck, you know, of the SUV as she's driving and hit the pavement. And this is, I don't call this really part of the NDE. It's more like a, that was an interesting experience that I still can't quite explain. But at that point, when I hit the pavement, luckily for me, I was like right in between her two front wheels. But when I hit, you know, my shoulder hit, my hip hit, and then my head, um, luckily I had a, a helmet on. But I could, I all of a sudden felt my consciousness split. And, and I was in my body at the same time that I was outside of my body. So the, the outside part of me that, which I now call, you know, my soul consciousness was watching the whole thing unfold. And, and that part of me was very calm and peaceful and trying to, trying to tell my human self, the human part of my consciousness, which was still in my body, don't worry, everything's going to be okay. It, it, you know, it's a horrible thing. You're afraid, but don't worry. It's, it's going to be okay. And I'm having this really, at the time, it seemed like crazy argument with myself, my human self and my higher self or my soul self was where they were, they were arguing with each other um, while the accident was continuing to unfold. So I hit the pavement and this woman didn't stop because she didn't know that she had hit anything. And my, my, um, my, ch I was wearing a backpack and my head, a chest strap across here. And somehow that chest strap got caught on something. I'm not really, st I'm still not really sure what it got caught on, but it got caught on something, you know, on the undercarriage of her, of her SUV. And at the same time that happened, I could see she was in a turn and I, it's in a split second knew that if, if I just stayed where I was on the pavement, I would get run over by the, 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 um, her rear wheels as she's in this turn. So I reached up with um, my right arm like this 
and grabbed, I was had my arm over the axle of her, of her vehicle trying to hang on. At least I assume that's what it was. It was, you know, something going across her, her vehicle. So she's dragging me underneath of her, of her SUV while she's going to just drive off and, you know, go wherever. Luckily for me, there was the guy that was in the truck that was behind her saw what had happened and he managed, I don't know how he did this. Thank gosh he did, but he somehow managed to drive around the traffic circle the wrong way and head her off. He basically parked his truck very quickly right in front of her so she couldn't continue on her path. And that's when all of this really stopped. Mm. So as soon as the paramedics came, um, those two parts of my consciousness came back together. And, and I remember I was laying there on the pavement thinking, what in the world just happened? You know, that <laughs> I didn't know what it was. I didn't know that could happen because I didn't really know anything about, you know, afterlife and soul and stuff. All I knew is that I was terrified to die at that point. And I, but I wasn't putting the pieces together. I was really too focused on, you know, staying alive. Um, luckily, I did have, there were a lot of lucky things that happened to get me through this part of, of the experience. So the guy that was in the, in the Subaru behind me, he just happened to be a trauma physician on his way to work. So he stopped and he was rendering aid on the scene. And another, another woman, actually, the woman was the first one to help me out. She was a trauma nurse at a hospital nearby, apparently. So she stopped and kept me from getting up and moving because I really wanted to just get up and run away. That was my first inclination. Um, it wasn't even a thought. It was just an impulse that I wanted to get up and run. So she kept me you know, down on the pavement, which... Basically, she saved my life because my neck and my back, but but my neck was so badly broken that if I had gotten up, I, I probably would have died on the scene. That's how bad my neck was broken. So she kept me down flat on the pavement and until the paramedics got there and then they were able to, you know, get me on a backboard and, and cart me off to the ER. Um, and, and luckily, the, the ER was a quarter a mile away from where I was struck, so maybe a half mile. It was somewhere in that range. So I was pretty close to the hospital. And once, you know, once I was there in the hospital, um, you know, they did all their tests and x-rays and scans and stuff, and they found out that I had about 24, 25 bones that were broken and it wasn't just a clean break one on each bone. It was each bone was broken in multiple places. So they basically just kind of stopped counting because they couldn't count all the different bone breaks. It was just so many. But most of the trauma was to my neck and my back. And my lower back was in really bad shape. My neck was in bad shape, but my lower back was it, it, it's tough to talk about, but it but there was one vertebrae that was basically just shattered to pieces. There wasn't anything left of it. Um, just a few little bits. So I, I was I was looking at being a paraplegic, you know, at that point. Um, luckily, I you know they brought in a really good surgeon who said, "Well, I I think I can fix this. We're going to schedule schedule you for surgery on Monday." Now this was Friday, so I was basically having to wait for a few days in order to get into the OR, and um, that first you know, that weekend I couldn't, I wasn't allowed to move. I was just basically lying flat on my back in the ICU, um, just trying not to be freaked out. So Monday, Monday comes along and the surgery was scheduled for like, I think it was three in the afternoon or something. And so I spent the whole day just terrified. You know, I was, I was terrified that I was going to die in this, in this um, operation. Now I'd had surgeries before, so I knew, I kind of knew what the, what the process was like. I knew what it felt like. Um, but I think because I was so badly injured, I was, I was a little freaked out. Like I was really concerned that this was going to be a, a difficult surgery for me. 
Um, and then I didn't know if I was, they didn't guarantee that I was going to be able to walk again. Um, so it was a, it was really a dicey uh, operation, at least from my standpoint. So they brought me, you know, three o'clock comes around, surgery was delayed. They finally got me into the OR, I think about four in the afternoon and, um, gave me the general anesthetic once I was in there and, and on the operating table. Um, and immediately I knew I kind of had this feeling something wasn't right, but I just drifted off and unbeknownst to me at the time, I didn't know this until later, um, my heart stopped at when they gave me the anesthesia and I stopped breathing and my blood pressure went to zero. So that's when that moment uh, of, of, you could, you could call it clinical death. I mean, it was, it was bodily death for sure occurred. And that, that lasted, I guess, about two minutes from what they told me later. Um, but, but I didn't know that. So I, when I drifted off, you know, normally during surgery, when, when you, when you get general, well, at least when I've gotten general anesthesia before, I basically, you know, used to just drift off into this gray state of sort of like gray fog. You know, there wasn't really anything to experience. It was just gray. And then they'd wake me up and I'd be in the recovery room. But this time I felt as if I didn't drift off into a gray state. I actually felt like I woke up and I woke up on a hillside and I was standing up and I thought, wait a minute, this isn't right. I'm not, <laughs> I just, I was just in surgery, at, you know, to repair my back my back and neck were broken. So why am I standing up? And I'm able to think about all of this, which it, it, in hindsight, you know, anesthesiologists and, and some other surgeons have said that you don't normally, you're not able to normally think when you're under general anesthesia. That's the whole point of it. So the fact that I was going through this whole process of analytical thinking was pretty unusual. Um, and that was one clue of, as to what was going on. But I'm going, th I'm running through this, like, kind of trying, litany of things, trying to figure out what was going on. Because I'm, what I'm seeing around me is this beautiful landscape, rolling hills and just little, you know, little drifts or little mists of fog, um, a beautiful, almost like a metallic blue sky, but it was more like a pearly blue, not, not really metallic, but it just glowed everywhere. I didn't see like a sun or a moon or anything, but the whole sky was just bright. And I thought, well, this is kind of cool. I could be here for a while, um, you know, just hanging out here during surgery. I thought at that point that I was, you know, dreaming or hallucinating or something. And then I, start, I started to think about, you know, I had been given a prescription drug for pain not, you know, maybe a year before this experience. And, and I hallucinated from it because I was, I had a reaction to it. And I started thinking about that, that Vicodin experience where I had gotten the Vicodin and hallucinated. And what I was experiencing was completely unlike, you know, that, that prescription med induced hallucination. Um, this was very lucid. It was very rational and very clear. There were no there was nothing what I would call crazy, but like my hallucination was just crazy stuff. This was not, this was very rational and lucid and, and, and almost, you know, um, very serious. And, and I started thinking about that and thought some more and I'm looking around and all of a sudden this wave of the only word I could use to describe it was pure, like a wave of pure love and peace. And I don't have any other words to describe it. It was just incredible. This wave of love and peace energy just came like right through me and, and, and almost like catapulted me out of this, this state I was, this analytical state I was in. And I, I, looked was kind of looking around for the source of it and I couldn't find the source. I was just in this wave of love and peace. And then it felt like almost like I was being held or embraced um, by I don't know what. 
it, but it just felt like I was being cradled or held. And that the love and peace just kept coming through me, almost like as if you're um, standing in front of a fire on a cold winter's day. It's just that radiant heat coming through you. But this I knew was love and acceptance and, and welcoming. And I started to cry because, it, you know, or at least that's my, my experience. I thought I was crying. I was just so moved by what I was feeling. And I'd never felt that way before. Like I'd never had that type of love on in my earthly life. I don't think you can. It, it was just so powerful. So I started crying and I, I began to wonder, oh my gosh, I wonder if I died on the operating table. But then my second thought was, well, if I did, what am I doing here? Because my, you know, my very religious family told me that if you were an atheist, you weren't going to go to heaven. You were going to go to someplace else, and it wasn't going to be very pleasant. So I'm thinking, wait, wait a minute, where am I? Why am I here? I don't believe in any of this stuff. And I'm, I'm really just thinking it in my head. I'm not, I'm not voicing it. And I paused, and then there was an answer that came from somewhere like outside of me. And that really startled me. I wasn't expecting an answer. And the answer was so beautiful and so welcoming. And it, and it said, you are my child. You are a part of me. You are a part of us. This is your home. Welcome home. And when I heard those words, it was like, it really was like coming home. And I always get, I always get choked up because I still remember how welcoming that was. And I, and I said, well, I don't believe in this. And it didn't matter. I was still welcomed into whatever this place was. And I just, I, I couldn't, I couldn't even think for, I don't know how long I was just, I think just reveling in that love and that peace and that welcoming and the acceptance. And I, I started to think, well, okay, I guess I did die. And then uh, I, I'm starting to think that in this figure uh, an actual like human like figure comes up from my right hand side and it looked like she was maybe coming out of the mist she was almost a materializing out of the mist and she said i am your teacher i'm your guide to you know this time that you're here and i'm here to teach you the things that you need to learn in order to go back to your life on earth and I said, I'm not going back. I don't want to go back there. Um, it, it was where I was now was just so beautiful and welcoming that it was hard for me to really wrap my brain around going back. Um, I didn't I didn't want to. I was home. I, I remembered that I was home. And she said, well, you've you, you've already agreed to go back. And I said, well, I don't remember that. <laughs> Um, I don't remember agreeing to anything when I came here. And she said, no, 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 before you were born, you know, you agreed to have certain experiences. And one of them was to have this, this experience of death and then go home. And I said, I don't remember, I just don't remember that. So in the air in front of me, you know, we see this in the movies all the time. And then I, I had it I had it happen to me in kind of in the air in front of me she showed me it was almost like a video but it was actually her memory of me standing before you could call it god or the divine presence or whatever but standing before some kind of you know big divine presence with all of my I would call them my soul family or my spirit family or whatever, kind of planning out what I wanted to do and accomplish here in, in this life that I had as Nancy. And, you know, I had agreed to certain things or at least try to accomplish certain things. It wasn't like it was a contract set in stone, but, but, but there were things that I wanted to have happen and, and experience and, and do. Um, and one, you know, one of those is that I wanted the experience of, being being an atheist, being a non-believer, and then to turn back toward belief, toward a more spiritual life at some point. And 
I had three different points in my life, <clears throat> excuse me, that I had that I had laid out for myself. And if I had missed going back into a spiritual life at points one and two, <clears throat> sorry, that I would have this NDE when I was at this point three, when I was, <clears throat> excuse me, 46 years old. So I had agreed to have three different points in my life where I could turn back to a more spiritual mindset. And, and if I didn't hit points one or two, then at point three that I would have this near death experience. And, you know, in my adult life, I had missed points one and two where I could have turned back. And so here I am um, getting this NDE, or I didn't know that's what it was at the time, but having this experience. So I said, well, I guess I did. I did remember it once she showed that to me. And I said, well, okay, um, I guess, I guess I'll go ahead and do what you want me to do. But in the back of my mind, I'm still thinking, well, I'm going to try to figure out a way to stay here. <laughs> really want to, I really don't want to go back, but I'm, I'm going to try to figure out a way to stay here, but I'll just humor her for a while while we, we go through and learn what I'm supposed to learn. So she took me really on this journey of what felt like if I was going to equate it to human time here on earth, what we did and experienced in in that time I was with her felt like it would take two to three months of earthly time to do. It was just that much stuff. Um, she taught me about, you know, love, the nature of divine love, the nature of peace, the nature of gratitude and loving our, the reasons why it's important to love this self that we have right now. Um, the importance of, of loving this life that we're in and, and appreciating it, uh, how, how important it is to make connections with other people and to make bonds with other people um, and to join in in community with others and to serve others. So there was a lot of stuff that she talked about and explained to me and showed me. It was a multitude of of ways to learn. Some of them were visual, some were just teaching, some were experiential. Um, there was one point where she she basically brought me to this huge map. It was a map, like you, an old fashioned nautical chart. And it was all around me. So I was kind of in the middle of it. It was kind of a virtual map, you know, all around me. And, and it and it was a demonstration of all the different choices that I had made in my life and how that those choices kind of came together and formed the path and the path can, you know, kind of go off to the side a little bit and diverge from where it was supposed to go. But, but in the end, you know, I was going to end up where I had wanted to be, you know, on this path in my life. So it was just a demonstration of the different paths that we can take and the choices we can make. But the most impactful part of this was really my life review, which I didn't know at the time that's what it was. Um, but she brought me to this beautiful little pond that looked like it was up in the mountains. And it was just this dark surface of a pond, like a almost a black water type pond. And she told me to touch the surface. And when I did, of course, you know, ripples kind of came out from where I, my hand touched the surface and across, just all across the pond surface, there were little, like, well, I call them mini YouTube videos almost. That's what it looked like at first, like these little tiny videos. And each one of those videos was an important piece of my life that it, when I focused on it, I could relive it. And in the reliving of it, it was, they were, they weren't like big events. They were interactions that I was having with other people. So there was one where I, I did something that helped someone and I was able to experience what I did, what I said and did at the same time, I could feel that other person's gratitude and appreciation for what I said or did. So I got to feel and remember, but basically remember both sides of, of that interaction. And likewise, 
there was a time um, and there were several of these, but there was like a time when I said something to hurt someone and I was a teenager and I was just being a dorky teenager, but it was very hurtful to my sister. So I, I got to experience her hurt as if I was her and her, it wasn't really trauma, but just how, how devastated she was that I would say something that hurtful to her as, and, and I was her big sister. So she looked up to me and I didn't realize that. So that was like this total aha moment. I remember just like sitting back with this, I felt like I had this astonished expression on my face, like, oh my gosh, I am totally looking at my life in a different way now. I didn't realize the the depth of interaction that I was having with other people and how important my words and actions were to how other people felt and that I could really help someone or hurt someone with what I said and did. It was just this huge awakening moment for me. And I started to be really ashamed of some of the negative things I had done in my life. None of them were, you know, hugely horrible, but, but still, I still felt some level of shame for having done that thing. And my teacher came in and she said, no, you're not, she could feel that I was feeling that. She said, no, you're not supposed to take away shame from this. This isn't a punishment, but it is a tool for you to learn. And you're supposed to learn from this and you're supposed to make better choices as a result of experiencing this. It still took me a while not to be ashamed. I will honestly admit that it was, that was a hard one to let go of. Um, but I eventually, eventually I did, but I understood her point. It was really a, a learning tool. We, we aren't there to beat ourselves up to feel horrible for being human because we're all human here on this planet. If you're watching this podcast, you're likely a human being and you're going to mess up. It's understood that you're going to mess up, but the important point is to learn from that and to make changes so that it doesn't happen again or something similar to it doesn't happen again. So that was my, my big, aha moment when I really understood just how important my my words and actions were in this existence that we call human life. Um, so shortly thereafter, um, I was sent back here, you know, to my life. She, my teacher had done a, a little healing on me before I came back and which was important for later because when I came back, I healed up very fast, like very fast, uh, completely unexpected by the doctors. Um, I came back into this life and he, I was completely out of all of my body casts and everything in four and a half weeks, not even five weeks. So in four and a half weeks, they had thought I would be in my, all of my body casts and stuff. And I was in a lot. <laughs> Um, they thought I would be in those for probably about 16 weeks. So to be out of them in just a little over four was pretty incredible. And my pain level was almost nothing. I didn't really have much pain. And the doctors were amazed by They kept trying to push pain medication on me. Like, you should really be on a lot more pain medication than you are. And I, And after, I think, three days... I, I humored them for three days after the surgery. And then I said, I can't do that stuff anymore. I'm just not in any pain. There's no reason, you know, for me to be in this uh, or taking this stuff. So I just refused it. And, and I was taking, um, I think it was Tylenol for a little bit, just for the incision pain that there was a little bit of pain with that, but for the broken bones, there really wasn't any pain, which, I, you know, I'd never broken a bone before, but I expected it to be a lot more painful. But I did heal up very quickly, which is a super huge blessing. And, and, but that's when really the rest of my journey started. Yeah. And it was a, it was a long journey after that of kind of bringing all of this information into my life, you know, here 
um, on this planet. Uh, and I'm not going to get into all of that, but but it's it was a journey. It wasn't like an automatic, oh, aha, now I'm enlightened kind of thing. It's it's a, still a daily, it's a daily journey. I, I look at it as a daily, my daily practice, really. Well, Nancy, thank you for sharing your experience with us. It sounds like one of your life purposes was becoming an atheist and then going back to not being an atheist. So where are you now on your spiritual journey? It's a great question. Yeah, it, it is. It definitely was part of my journey to have that experience of turning away. And now I am, I'm probably a better scientist now than I ever was because I, well, first of all, I've had the experience of knowing for myself what comes after this physical body. Um, we all go through that final transition. I am not scared of it anymore. You know, I've been through it a couple times now. So I, I understand that there is something grander and bigger than just this physical life. But this is an important life. Don't get me wrong. What we're experiencing here is very important. But I know now that there is something bigger and grander than me. I mean, I personally call, I go back and forth as to what I call that grand consciousness. And there really was a grand divine consciousness that I interacted with. And I don't doubt it for a second. I, I don't know what to call it. You know, my, my initial thought was to call it God, but and I still do sometimes because I think all of these words really are, at some point, they're equivalent. But the term God for me had a lot of baggage because I because of the, the way that I was raised. And, and it didn't feel great for me after a while. So I just started calling it the divine presence because to me, that's what was more accurate. It was this huge divine presence. Um, and I know that we're all we have eternal souls, if you want to call it a soul or an eternal essence, which is what those on the other side call it, an essence. So we have these eternal souls that go basically go back to this home state of being that after this death, you know, this, this transition away from this life, which we call death. Other than that, I, I don't know what that grander scheme is. Like, I keep asking myself, well, wait a minute, where did God come from? You know, where did all this stuff? I, my scientist tries to keep kicking in and it wonders where all of that comes from. I don't know the answer to that yet, but I do know that there is definitely something grander and more connected and more loving than, than just this life here. And, and that divine consciousness or that divine presence is unbelievable. I mean, it it's everywhere. There is nowhere. You can't escape from it. People think they can. I thought I could for a long time. You can't escape from it. It's just pervasive through every little atom and, and even subatomic particle of this entire universe. So that's where I am. Uh, I'm still I'm still reading. I'm still seeking. I still meditate. I have a daily practice of prayer, and I I continue to to expand my awareness of whatever that is actively, because it's it's well it's fun. It's interesting. I learn a lot, um, and it still and it feels it feels good in my heart to be able to do that. You know, so I feel it really distinctly in my heart that when I reconnect or try to reconnect in whatever way I can, either through prayer or whatever, I just feel good. And, and so that tells me that this is something I need to be doing. So I, I make it a daily practice to continue to seek out and make connection with that, that divine presence. I'm assuming then if you had to label yourself, you would consider yourself agnostic at this point? Um, I think a little strong. I mean, I probably a little stronger than that. A lot in, in current, a lot of agnostics are really atheists. So I don't really like that term. They, they try to, you know, a lot of agnostics will use the agnostic term to kind of hide the fact that they're really closet atheists. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I would just call myself a seeker and, um, an open-minded seeker for sure. And somebody who realizes that 
I'm, I'm way more curious than I ever was as a scientist. It's just a scientist because I can start to see that there is a heck of a lot more weird stuff going on in this universe than I ever thought existed and weird from the standpoint of a scientist of a, of a physical scientist. But when you pull, when you pull it out of that, those confines of modern day traditional physical sciences, then it's, then things start to make sense. You know, even quantum physics was weird when it came out. It still is weird. That's what I'm talking about. Like, I think there's a bigger explanation here and I want to know what it is, but I still know that there is some kind of divine presence, that divine consciousness that, that is connecting all of this. Um, so I, I guess I'm, I'm a seeker, but I'm not, I don't necessarily as, like go to a specific church or synagogue or anything on a specific day of the week. Um, for me, I guess I tend to, because of my upbringing, I, I tend to resonate a lot with the teachings of Jesus, but I try to practice them as a practice. You know, the love, the compassion, the the reaching out and making connection with people and the forgiveness and that part of it. Um, but I try to keep myself in a place where I look at each different faith that we have here as a piece of the puzzle, not the whole puzzle in and of itself. So each faith has some really amazing aspects to it that I like to pay attention to and that I like to, you know, investigate and, and they're, they're valid. Um, but I tend not to just jump on the bandwagon of a particular faith just for, for that, you know, reason I want to keep I want to keep myself a little bit sort of my mom calls it like you're still kind of like a doubting Thomas, really, <laughs> which was a, a, you know, one of Jesus's followers. But it's more like a curious, a, a curious George now at this point. I like to I like to I like to make connections between these different religions, between our different beliefs, rather than build walls between them. So I, I'm a I'm a bridge builder instead of a wall builder because we are more alike than we are different. And that's why I, I kind of do what I do. I, we're just so divided right now that I want to build those bridges across faiths so that people can see that we're all, we're all just here having a human experience together. And it's all about love, really, and about helping and connection and peace. I think that's great. What I found interesting was that the driver didn't feel hitting you and you were on her windshield banging on her window or the hood and had no clue that you were there. Since you planned this out, do you think that the universe was controlling her as well as part of this plan? And that's why she was so distracted. And I, that's a good point. I think, I think there was, there's a little bit more to it. I think she was per, certainly part of the plan. Absolutely. And, and so it, interestingly enough, I forgave her pretty quickly because I started to think about that. Like she's a whole, she's part of this, but I was also part of her, of her awakening in that point. So <clears throat> in order for me to have this NDE, she, like you said, she had to be distracted. And in order for her to get her life put back together because she was on a really bad trajectory before this, apparently, which I found out later. Um, this was not the first time this happened. She was on a, on a pretty, pretty bad path in her life of, of doing things like this. And I think part of the reason I was there was also to help her. So we helped each other, I think at a soul level, um, with whatever we both needed to learn. And, and, you know, I learned a lot from that, from her. I am hoping in, you know, that she was able to also make a shift in her life and learn from that experience. Um, because I'm sure it was not easy for her to realize, oh my gosh, you know, I basically almost just killed somebody. Um, so I think it, it was mutual. It was a mutual um, agreement that, that was made. Whether... 
whether it was the universe working through her or working through both of us, I don't know. It may have just been at our soul level where we remembered, you know, that this is the path that we were on. Um, but yeah, I think a lot of learning happened that day and in the days that followed. <laughs> you mentioned making choices. Do you think that a big part of our lives are about making choices? The life is really about choice. You know, it's it's learning how to be aware and awake enough in each moment and that's part of the journey that we're here to do but learning how to be aware and awake enough to make love-based or compassion-based choices in your life instead of instead of a lot of us make choices and we don't often realize it but a lot of the choices that we make are based on some level of fear until we have some kind of an awakening or we're have one of those aha moments and realize that we don't have to make choices that way anymore. We can make decisions based on a higher, on a higher uh, level of consciousness, like love or compassion or peace. And that's really what it's about. I mean, if you look at your life, it is a, just a series of choices. Everybody has decisions to make. And it can even be at a very small granular level. How do I interact with my kids in the morning? How do I interact with the grocery store clerk um, or, you know, somebody at the toll booth if you have to pay toll manually? How do I enter? It's just these small little, it's not the big, what kind of job do I have choices that matter? It's the little ones. It's our interactions and how we decide we're going to interact with each other. And those are the ones that really matter. Once we start making those choices <clears throat> with love or peace in mind instead of fear or hatred or whatever, then we're, we're on our best path in life. I never thought about it before until you said it, that a lot of NDEs appear to follow the teachings of Jesus. Can you give me some examples of other religious teachings that you have found within your NDE? Yeah, you know, when I look back at it, um, there are... Certainly, you know, the love and compassion is, is a big part of it, but those are also a part of Buddhism too. And when I started to, to talk to people about some of the things that I learned, that's when I realized they, those were in a lot of other faiths too. And, and um, I had a lot of people from the Jewish faith come to me and said, wow, geez, you know, a lot of what you talk about is really part of our faith. And it's a part of how we interact with each other. Um, and especially people who studied the Kabbalah. I, I've not studied the Kabbalah, but, but I've had a lot of um, practitioners and people who study the Kabbalah say that what I teach is, or what I talk about is really part of their teachings. Um, certainly Buddhism, it, it comes through very strongly in a lot of what I learned and, and during my NDE and since. And again, that's the compassion. It's allowing other people to make their own choices in life. That's a very strong part of Buddhism. But I, I, it's not as, for me, it isn't as quite as strict as in Buddhism. Like if I feel like I can't help someone else, I will along their path, but I also respect their path. So in Buddhism, there's this drive to allow people to walk their own path. They have, each person has their, their own path in life and you're supposed to respect that but I also I have that compassion that love and, and I help out when I can um, I've I, I did a podcast a while ago with some people from the Lakota nation uh, and I think it was South Dakota and a, we were comparing notes afterward we, we had a whole different conversation after that podcast and I, I, they, we, we all realize the same thing, like, shoot, this is exactly what they teach in their, in their faith as well. So a lot of this stuff, like I said, is, is, is across different faiths. Um, I've even had people from the, from, from it, who are uh, Muslims contact me and say, wow, a lot of this stuff is in what we believe as well. So there are a lot, of, especially like the love um, and, um, you know, some of those beliefs centered around compassion and love. So there are a lot of things that just span these different 
religious beliefs. And that's really amazing to me how, how, how strongly we are alike, that our differences really aren't that important. And that's what I like to talk about when I, when I have these conversations with people of different faiths is, gosh, we are a lot alike, aren't we? Um, you know, I may, I may ascribe to a specific set of beliefs, but that doesn't mean that all these other things that people talk about aren't true and aren't real. I don't know much about any of the religions. I haven't studied them personally, but from what you're saying, and perhaps the core of all these religions are love and compassion. It seems to me to be the case. It's, you know, it, it, I was really astounded with the Lakota folks because I didn't know anything about about their beliefs, but that, to have them come and talk to me about that, it, it, I started looking at like the Kabbalah and, and Buddhism. It is love and compassion. When I spoke with, um, and much later, I spoke with people of the Navajo uh, tribe, the Navajo nation, same thing. You know, there's that same love and compassion living each day in a conscious uh, awareness of our choices and making what they call living in beauty, um, but making beautiful choices compassionate choices, choices that, you know, basically add to the love of the universe rather than detract from it. It's, it, it, it's astounding to me how similar these all are, right? And it is, seems to be based on love, compassion, kindness, um, treating each other well. So those are just those core beliefs, those core tenets that really link us all together. And I have to believe there's a reason for that. I think that's our basic the basic understanding of what we're supposed to be doing when we're here. What is your opinion about why we come here in the first place? It's, I think that, I think that's part of it. So it's different for each person. Each person has their own specific set of things that they want to learn about or experience. At its base, this is, this is where I am right now with my, with my thinking and belief. At its base, it seems that we're here to learn or experience or help other people. Those are the three like we're here for our basic reason is one of those three. Certainly across the board, it's to learn love, but not not divine love, but learn how to be loving here in this physical place where it's hard to do that sometimes. You know, learn how to act in loving ways, be a loving person, not just with your family members, but with other people. So to to learn how challenging that is here in the physical, to relearn how to be that way in all aspects of reality, not just when we're in heaven or the afterlife. Um, so that's, that's a core. You know, a lot of people are here to learn stuff, it seems. Um, they may be a soul that hasn't had a lot of, you know, time uh, to learn things. And so they're here to learn things. And this is a super, super great place to do that because so much happens. It's a tough incarnation for some people. You know, it's, it's tough being here. It's tough living in that loving state. Sometimes it's tough being love. So if you can do that here where things are so challenging, it's almost like, wow, I really figured this out quickly. It's, it's, it's an it's a quick it's not an easy way but it can be a quick way to learn a lot of that stuff some of us come in it seems to learn or just to just help other people along whatever path they have chosen and i've run across that with you know some of my um i do some work with regression therapy and i've i've come across that a couple of different times already and there are people that come here just to support others and to help other people learn. Um, so it's almost like a selfless uh, time that they're here, a selfless state of being. But it is different for everybody. I, I can't really, there's not one blanket. The only blanket I can say is learning how to be more loving. You know, that seems to be across the board. Uh, on top of that, it's different for each person. All right, Nancy, well, I said in the beginning you had two NDEs, so can you tell us about your second one? Sure. So the second one happened, it was December of 2017, so almost four years later. 
uh, I had gone on a business trip uh, from where I lived and then come back home and it picked up some kind of what I thought was a lung infection or something. It was, it was really affecting my lungs um, when I came, came back from this trip. And it was, I happened to be gone right before Christmas. I came back Christmas day. I was fine. And then the day after Christmas, I started feeling congested, you know, in my upper part of my lungs and in my throat. And within four hours of starting to feel that I was really ill. Uh, I was running a horrible fever. I could barely breathe. Uh, it was pretty horrible. I thought for sure I had pneumonia. Um, and it happened to be in the evening. I thought, well, shoot, maybe I should just go to bed. Hopefully I'll be better in the morning. Um, that wasn't the case. <laughs> I actually woke up a few times during the middle of the night, you know, went, got up and tried to get some water or whatever. I passed out like three different times, just you know, going to get some water. And in the morning when I finally, I woke up on the floor of my bedroom instead of in the bed, I realized I should probably go to the hospital. <laughs> this is not good. And um, so I got in, you know, I got into the hospital. They put me in the ER right away, but it was a really busy emergency room. And the, the nurses and doctors were scrambling. They had a, like a gunshot wound and a big traffic accident. So there were several really critical people that were being brought into the ER just as I was, you know, coming in as well. So they put me on an IV and they had done uh, an initial chest x-ray to see, you know, what was going on in there. And then they dis disappeared. So I was on this IV. I was actually being monitored with my blood pressure too, but for about 20 minutes, the nurses and doctors were gone. They were, they were tending to these more serious cases. So I'm laying there in the ER and I could hear the, the beeper on the heart rate monitor start to go off. And the beeper goes off as an alarm when your heart rate goes below a certain level. So my heart rate was at that point below, I think it was below 25, which is pretty low. <laughs> and that's when the, the beeper was just beep, 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 going off, trying to get the attention of the nurses. And, and it just kept going off. And I could feel like my breathing rate was going way down. And then my, my, I stopped, I couldn't feel my feet anymore. And my legs started to go numb and my hips started to go numb. And then my hands started to go numb and I couldn't, it was like my consciousness was sort of like drawing down into just this little part. I couldn't feel anything in my body anymore. And then I couldn't hear anything. So my hearing, I couldn't hear anything anymore. I just, it just gently stopped. I just realized, Oh, I'm not hearing any of the noises in the room, nothing. And then I couldn't see anything. So my blunt, my, I, my eyes were wide open, but everything went black. And that's when I just started floating up above my body. And I, I looked down, I was about halfway between the bed and the ceiling. So I don't know if that's like three feet above the bed or whatever, four feet. And I'm still kind of in a laying down position on my back. And I sort of did this weird roll and I looked down and there's my body laying out on the table right below me. And, and I thought, wow, this is the way most people die. It's just this gentle, you know, gentle leaving of the body and then your soul goes on. And just as I was thinking that, I heard this amazing music coming from all around me. It was that heavenly divine music that so many people report. And I started to feel that love all over again that I felt during my first NDE. And I thought, oh, I'm going to go home now. <laughs> this is it. You know, kind of an anticlimactic, you know, end to my life. Um, dying, you know, dying from pneumonia on the operating or on the uh, emergency room table. But I'm up there, you know, kind of toward the ceiling and I'm hearing this music and I'm feeling all this love. 
and I'm getting ready to, you know, I'm looking around trying to find this tunnel that everybody talks about, didn't see it. And then all of a sudden I heard that voice again, that same voice that talked to me in my first NDE. And that voice said, your choice, stay or go, which will it be? And that's all it said, your choice, stay or go, which will it be? This time it was up to me to decide whether I wanted to stay here on, on this planet in my life or whether I wanted to go on. It was, I was cool with whatever. And then I had these, you know, knowings that came to me. I think I was being shown what would happen either way and how I could be useful if I stayed here. And I saw how I could be useful if I stayed here and in my heart, I, cho I chose to stay. And as soon as I made that choice in my heart, I was just basically slammed right back into my body. So it was pretty startling. Like I'll, I did a, a kind of a jerk like that and looked around and I could feel my hands and feet again. I could hear things again. Um, I, I was back in my body and my heart rate monitor was back to where it should be. It wasn't beeping anymore. Just shortly after that, the doctor, the physician came in and she went over my, um, my earlier x-rays with me. And she said, well, you know, you've got, you've got pneumonia. You're only breathing out of like a quarter of, or a half of one lung. So you're, you're down to about a quarter lung capacity at this point. And I said, are you sure? <laughs> I said, I feel fine now. And she kind of didn't want it, like, what are you talking about? I said, I feel fine. I don't feel like anything's I'm congested or anything. Um, I feel, I feel good. And she said, well, let me listen to your chest. And so she listened to my chest. She said, huh, you sound fine. I don't know what I was hearing before, but you sound fine. Let's do another scan. So they did another scan and everything was clear. So within that, I don't know, 20 minutes to a half an hour, whatever was going on in here cleared up. And, and she said, I don't know why we're doing this, but we're letting you go. I was going to put you in to the ICU, but we're just going to let you go now since you're okay. And, and then I was fine. Like my fever just completely went away. I was fine to go home. And, and that kind of told me exactly that, that, that experience, first of all, it was real. You know, they, they saw the before and after in 20 minutes, my, my pneumonia healed up, but also, um, that I was here this time, the second time around, I made my choice. The first time around, I still felt like I came back against my will, even though I didn't, but it still felt like that a little bit. But this time, my choice to stay here was very conscious. And that completely changed the way that I looked at being back here. Um, I wasn't angry or sad about it anymore. I knew I was here for a reason and a purpose. And, and I wanted to help specific people out and, and it just reset my thinking. So it wasn't like the big glitzy, you know, NDE that we talked about earlier, but it was still very important for me to go through that second one and to have it be so different, but yet also very loving and, and compassionate. Do you feel that you planned for this second NDE pre-birth or do you think that this was just a possible test of choices? My gut tells me it was the latter, that it was a it was an opportunity and a test. Not really necessarily a test, but but an opportunity to make a choice that was different. And I mean, I kind of had a I have a feeling that, you know, God, God or the universe or spirit or whatever you want to call that divine consciousness kind of knew what I was going to do. Um because when when you're for most souls for most people when you're confronted by that hugeness and the reality of god or the divine presence you, it, it's like all all of your own little whiny needs and insecurities just kind of vanish 
And if it, it, and at least for me, when, when I saw that I was needed here, then I made that choice to stay no matter what, like no matter how hard it was, if I knew that I was needed here and could make a difference, then I was going to be here and no, no question about it. So I think, I think it was kind of known what my decision would be, but I was given the out and it, and it wasn't, it, it wouldn't have been held against me, I think, if I had chosen to leave. But I think they already, you know, God already figured that out. <laughs> After either one of your NDEs, did you have any cognitive changes that could be considered psychic? Um, that's a good, really good question. I, you know, I had very strong intuitive abilities before either of these. I just discounted them. And, and so I don't know if it was a result of going through these near death experiences or just me not discounting them anymore, but I do have some abilities to, to kind of feel like, especially with my family members or close friends, I can, even if they're far away, I can kind of feel what's going on for them. I try not to go there because it's a little bit intrusive, but but, but for example, I had a friend, uh, a younger friend who for many years had said that she didn't want to have kids and she got married and she still insisted she didn't want to have kids. And, and it was um, a few months after that second NDE where I woke up in the morning and I'm like, oh my gosh, she's pregnant. Hmm. I didn't know where that came from. And she's, you know, she sent me a uh, I think it was a text a little bit later that day to tell me that she was pregnant. And I said, yeah, I, already, I kind of already knew. Mm. <laughs> she said, how did you know? I haven't even told my husband yet because he was off on a business trip and she was going to tell him that night. And I said, I don't know. I just knew it was pretty apparent. So I have that kind of connection with people. You know, I kind of get, get that sense of if people are in trouble or um, if someone needs me, I, I usually end up on the phone with them pretty quickly. Um, other psychic, I don't know about other psychic abilities. You know, I'm not really as much into that. To me, it's more about how do I live my life in a, in a better way each day. I don't get, try not to get caught up in all that other stuff. After either one of your NDEs, did you ever experience depression because you experienced this love on the other side that maybe we all yearn for. Oh, howdy. <laughs> yes, that is actually a very common thing to have happen. Uh, not the second one, but the first one most definitely. And, and I've talked about it a few times. It's one of those things that at least up until my first near-death experience, people didn't want to talk about it. I got the sense that you don't, you don't talk about those those negative things that can happen afterward. And I just did. I'm like, you know, I, I went in, actually, that was one of my speeches at a conference um, about the stuff that can happen afterward that people don't like to talk about. And it was, it was, it was like grief. It was a huge separation from what I felt was that love was, was a direct connection with that divine presence a direct connection with my soul family, you know, the people there that were my soul family, it was a huge loss. It was, it was like losing a parent times a hundred. And, and I did, I I was, I was also a bit angry at being sent back, sent back here, you know, against my will, even though I had agreed to it, it still felt like I mentioned before, it still felt a little bit against my will. And and I really did have, it wasn't a deep depression, but I was depressed. I was, and it probably lasted a good 18 months. It was really hard. Um, and I talk about it a lot with people who go through experiences like this, that it's okay. You'll get through it. Just talk with people that you love, talk with other experiencers and you'll get through it. But it is hard. It's really challenging for most of us to come back here be cut off from all of that love, all of that peace, all that joy, and be surrounded by kind of the grind of the daily life again. But it's normal. 
it's a normal part of that experience, but I just encourage people, you know, to talk to other people, get help, get, I, I got a lot of help from a chaplain. Um, you know, there's a lot of places to get help for that. Tons of near death experience support groups out there. So yeah, there's a lot of us that can help out with that. A lot of my guests will report that it's more real on the other side than it is here. Like this is the dream and that's real. As a scientist, how can you explain that to us? Yeah, that's tough because I felt the same way. Like, I didn't even know how I knew it. I just knew that that was real and this was the dream. So I think we're what we're probably seeing is we're looking at it, when we're in this body, our, when our consciousness or our soul consciousness is here in this body, we think this is all there is. And this is the only consciousness that's there. But from with that wider perspective, what I'm thinking now is that this experience that we're having here is just a temporary little part of our grand experience as a soul. And, and that really truly is real. So if, if you can, in your mind, flip around, you know, that idea of of the afterlife being the dream realm and this being reality. That's really what it is. This is sort of like the dream that we come into in that reality of our soul's life. That, that what, what my teachers told me during my near death experience, she said, what you call the afterlife is really your true life. And this life that you say that you have right now is really just a dream. So I've had to flip that around. As a scientist, I think we're understanding consciousness wrong. We're understanding consciousness from the standpoint of being in a dream. And we think that this is all there is. But we're, and and I think this is changing. You know, we're starting to really investigate consciousness, that it isn't produced by this organ up here in our skulls, that 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 our brains kind of pull in an aspect of our consciousness for a short time, it gives our, it gives our, our part of our soul or our soul's consciousness a place to live in and, um, and have this simulated reality. It's really, to me, a simulation. That's how I look at it. More like, um, in, in a way, and, and, and don't take this the wrong way, but it's sort of more like the movie The Matrix than it isn't. And I don't mean the, the really nasty, dark parts of The Matrix, but, but the simulated part of The Matrix, that this is a simulated form of reality. It's real, but it's simulated as a place for our soul's growth, our souls to learn, to grow, um, to maybe even evolve or advance if that if you want to look at it that way but but it is just a small segment it's a small filter of reality you know when we look at what our eyes can see you know visibly in the visible the visible spectrum is just a tiny little bit of the entire electromagnetic spectrum that's out there so if you think about it in that terms that in sort of a corollary that this life that we're in is just a tiny little bit of the real grand experience of of our consciousness um and, and so it really is a simulated reality it's still real while we're here it's still valuable but again as my guide said or my teacher said what you call the afterlife is your is your true life. And she even joked about it with me. She she calls this a near life experience. And that's real life. So mm-hmm. it, it it's it, it's it was a joke for her, a little bit of a kind of a poke and fun at the term. Like this is this is a near life experience. It isn't your true life. Have you ever pondered or considered that being on earth, this is a difficult game to play because you come here to learn something and experience something, but you start the game off remembering nothing and being in an environment which you have no control over with your family. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the the learning there is at some point you learn that you do have more control than you think you do. And that takes a long time. You know, certainly as children, you're not going to have that control. Um, because you're not going to be learning that. Now, some people do come into this life with a lot of memory of before. 
Um, and, and so a lot of little kids, especially, will have memories of having been with God and um, or with, you know, their their soul family or whatever. So there are a lot of kids that come in with that memory and are, at least in the Western world, um, we're taught to discount that. And so we kind of lose that as we get older. Um, but it is a, it is a challenging place. The, and and I, I thought about why is it that we lose so much of that, that connection to those longer term memories, or so many of us do. I know some people that that have never forgotten, but but for the vast majority of us that we come in forgetting. And I think that's part of the game. Like you said, it's part of the game to learn how to almost channel, like channel your soul's essence to live from your soul because your soul remembers, right? Your soul has that memory, even if it can't necessarily express it as a, as a distinct memory, it knows what you're here to do the challenge is allowing your soul to do it. And that's where that, that human, the human ego self and the soul self kind of, you know, but, but heads when you're here in your life, the challenge to me is learning how to live from your soul's consciousness, from your heart space and let, let the ego kind of take a rest and, and maybe chirp up and give its, you know, two cents every once in a while. But, but even if you don't have distinct memories of what you're supposed to do or what that afterlife is like, your soul, I think, still has that essence of, I have a feeling I'm supposed to be doing something else with my life. Like, this doesn't feel right to me. And, and you're able to make, I think, more heart-based decisions, more love-based decisions when you allow that soul consciousness to really take the take the steering wheel of your life and, and let the ego kind of sit off in the passenger seat for a while. Um, and that's where I think it's valuable to not, maybe not really remember as much because that's the, that to me is the journey. That's the important part of the journey in learning how to live from your soul's wisdom rather than from the ego, which is fear. It's, it's competition. Um, the ego is all about anger and, uh, but it's mostly fear. It's it's mostly afraid. It wants to keep you alive, but it's a very fearful place, and not all of that fear is is justified. Um, so getting to that point, I think, of living from your soul's awareness on a daily basis is what we're most of us are going to be challenged to do, and that's really for me, at least in my life, the golden key for of what I need to be able to experience and do. Some of my NDE guests said that while being on the other side, they realized that this whole life here is almost like a joke and we take it too seriously. Did you get an impression like that? Yeah. In fact, um, not necessarily that it's a joke, but definitely that we need to take it less seriously, that we're supposed to you know, one of the last things that my teacher taught me before she sent me back was enjoy your life. It's meant to be enjoyed. It's meant to be savored. You're meant to love your family and your kids and whoever, you know, whoever's around you. Enjoy it. And I, I should have I should have printed this out, but she said something like basically you can laugh at its ridiculousness and enjoy you know, feeling your um, getting out there and doing things like she said, climbing a mountain or skiing or enjoy being here in the physical, because that's part of that's part of the journey is to enjoy this physical life. And she said, you all take it a lot. A lot of you take it way too seriously. Um, it, there are serious elements to it, but have fun you know, enjoy being outside or with your family or singing in the shower, even if you can't sing in the shower. Um, just do all of that crazy sounding stuff because it is meant to be enjoyed. It is a lighthearted existence. And if you can just live in love and enjoy your life, that's the key that right there. You don't have to do too much. There is so much violence, pain, unhappiness, hatred in this world. 
do you think that somehow we've all gotten way off track somewhere and maybe that's why people like you and this podcast are here kind of trying to help fix things? I think so. I think, you know, we're, I, I mean, I, I asked about some of that. Why, why'd you choose me? You know, why, why am I getting this experience? And, and part of it is that you're just a normal person and we are here. I, I, I believe, I don't have specific proof, but I believe that those of us who have had these experiences or others like, you know, there are other kind of similar types of experiences I think that we're here because society itself has gotten off track. You know, each individual person or soul is here to maybe learn something or grow or whatever, experience things. But but the other, you know, if you look at it as in a bigger picture, the entire society, or, and I mean now a global society, is also kind of going through a learning experience and we're trying to figure out how to grow up gracefully as a society. But, but I think, yes, yeah, society has gotten off track because society itself has really bought into this idea that that fear-based ego is really all that there is. Even though a lot of us are spiritual or we have these beliefs, we're still living as if that fearful ego-based self is all there is. And, and so I think these experiences, all of us are here to kind of broaden our understanding of really what is society uh, headed toward. And really more importantly, that we absolutely do have the ability to change where we're headed. You know, it, 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 it's, it's not that it's going to be easy, but we all do together have this ability to change where we're headed as a society. And I think that's why I was sent back with this feeling like I needed to connect people rather than divide people. You know, my personal beliefs aside, we are more, you know, alike than we're not. And, and I think that that's an important lesson for everybody right now but the violence you know the anger the hatred all of that stems from fear if you go back to the base level of all of those things it's really fear-based but it isn't just individual people who are afraid it's it's like an entire group of people or even a society that has bought into these ideas of separation and fear so i, I think you're right that we're here each voice is individual. Each of us, each of our voices will connect with certain people, not everybody, but my voice connects with certain people. And, you know, there are other voices that will connect with others and that's all, that's all okay. It's all valuable and it's all necessary, but we're here really to just allow people to think about how much we're alike, that we're here to love and we don't need to buy into all of this other negative states, these other negative states of being. All right, Nancy, I've gone way over time with you <laughs> and I could still keep going, but um, I need to kind of change gears with you here. Okay. I mentioned you're an author. You have three books, I believe, Awakenings from the Light, Messages from Heaven and Walking in the Light. Right. If people want to get those, those are on Amazon, I'm assuming. Um, they're either on my website, nancyryans.com, or you can go to Amazon. Yep. All right. Um, and you also are an artist and we can check out your work at nancyryansstudio.com. Exactly. I've also got a link to it from nancyryans.com. So. All right. Well, is there anything you're working on right now that you want us to know about? I am. I just started working on another book. Uh, one of my readers suggested it to me. And it's really the follow-up to Awakenings from the Light, but it's, I had been asked many, many times to dive into the teachings of love in Awakenings from the Light. And that's what I'm doing in this new book. And the, the tentative title is called Remembering Love. So that's what it's about. I'm going to be doing a deep dive into the concept of divine love, the love that we have for each other, and how we can um, you know, increase that in our lives and in our society here on this planet. Hmm. All right. That'll be great. That's a great reason to have you back. 
and All I right. can continue asking my questions. Okay. What about workshops and mentoring? I do offer workshops. In fact, I'm in the middle right now of planning a small group workshop that'll be held in the Denver, Colorado area a little bit later, uh, either late summer or early autumn, so before winter hits. And I, I'm, I'll let everybody know, if you sign up on my website, uh, nancyryans.com for updates, I'll let people know uh, when that's going to be and what the topic of that is. But that one's going to be, it'll be spiritually based, but it'll be fun. I don't want it to be heavy and, and downer. I want us to enjoy getting back together again in person. So it'll be a fun but informative workshop that we can we can all do together. And then I do do individual mentoring sessions. Again, information on that is available on my website. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Absolutely. Everybody out there, you're all loved. You're you're all loved way more than you can possibly imagine. We're all connected by that love and we're all a part of it. So thank you all for listening to me and thank you for having me on today. Thank you for that message and thank you for being my guest. I wish you the best, Nancy. Thank you. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.